Welcome to the Born Katamit United Methodist Home Worship Service. Thank you for wel welcoming us into your home. Please read the bold words and sing the hymns with us. Let us now sing Shalom. Our psalm today is Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4 and 15 through 18. Please read uh, the bold sections with me. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said... I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exult in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, by your favor, our horn is exalted. For our, our shield belongs, belongs to the Lord, our, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Israel. Oh, Lord, you love is constant. You have faithful to all generations. Let us now sing the summons. Sing. Will you let 
opening prayer. God of freedom and miracles, we wait for your voice and direction today. We are so wrapped up with worries about the pandemic that we often miss the words of anguish arising around us. News of tragedy and demonstrations blared us from all directions. Hear our cries, O Lord, come and comfort and heal our wounds. Open our hearts this day that we might become people who bring peace and hope to those in despair. For we ask these things in the name of the Master Healer, Jesus Christ, Amen. Let us now say, as we have been taught, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading is Jeremiah 28, verses 5 through 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak to your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, pestilence, against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Would you join me in unison with the Independence Day prayer? Almighty God, creator and ruler of all nations and peoples, we thank you for this land and nation that we love. We pray that you will help and inspire all those to whom you have committed responsibilities for leadership here in our homeland and also in all the nations around us with whom we share this earth. That all may know your peace and learn to live together in peace. Give to all the grace and the will to love and obey you. Give to the people of this, our nation, special zeal for your justice wisdom, truth, and mercy, that we may use all of our liberty in full accord with your law of love. Forgive our failings and shortcomings, we pray. Make us ever mindful that you alone are true Lord and ruler of all. Purify our hearts and minds to worthily love and serve you and your kingdom above all. We pray with gratitude through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior.
Today's second reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. Please follow along with the bold print. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. You, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But, but now, now that you have, have been freed from, from sin, sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now it's children's time. Hi, welcome to children's time. Do you like cookies? Oh, I love cookies, especially chocolate chip cookies, but even better, chocolate chip peanut butter cookies. I don't like to share my cookies. When I have cookies, I want to eat them all. And if somebody comes over and I think they're going to want to eat my cookies, I'm probably going to hide them in the freezer. Well, the children in today's story love cookies too. And let's see what happens every time the doorbell rings. Here's our story. Doorbell Rang by Pat Hutchins. I've made some cookies for tea, said Ma. Oh, good, said Victoria and Sam. We're starving. Share them between yourselves, said Ma. I made plenty. That is six each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as Grandma's, said Victoria. And they... Smell as good as Grandma, said Sam. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Mom, as the doorbell rang. It was Tom and Hannah from next door. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's three each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as your Grandma's, said Hannah, and smell as good as your Grandma's, said Sam. No one makes cookies like Grandma said, Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Peter and his little brother. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's two each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as Grandma's and smell as good, too, said Peter. No one makes cookies like Grandma said, Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Jory and Simon with their four cousins. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That is one each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as Grandma, said Jory. They smell as good as Grandma, said Simon. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. And rang. Oh dear, 
said Ma as the children stared at the cookie on their plate. Perhaps you should eat them before I open the door. We'll wait, said Sam. It was Grandma with an enormous tray of cookies. Yay! How nice to have so many good friends to share with, said Grandma. It's a good thing I made a lot. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. In our book today, the doorbell rang. Not only this mother and grandmother, but also the children welcome and share their cookies with whoever appears at the door. This is rare. I don't know if I've ever seen children do this so willingly. It's quite apparent to me that this grandmother taught her daughter the importance of welcoming and sharing, and the daughter taught her children. They all, without thinking or hesitation, reenact Christ's lessons in their home each day. They share what they have and welcome all to the warmth of their table. I'm so glad that you came and joined me today. God's blessings and love on each of you today. Stay safe and join me again next week. Amen. The third reading is from Matthew 10, verses 40 to 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of of the disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of the Lord. I would like to wish uh, Pastor Tim and Rhea a happy wedding anniversary. They're taking the week off and celebrating with Rowie. And I appreciate Tim asking me to fill in today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart please you, dear Lord. We've been reading Matthew for most of the month of June now. In Matthew, Jesus has told us how he has chosen the disciples, how he's training them, and he's now getting ready to send them out into the world with a few words of advice. And I was wondering how I could um, use this sermon to describe some of the things that I've learned from the readings as I've done them. And it reminded me of applying for a job let's say a job for the God company. What characteristics would God be looking for in us if we were to be hired? What would be the benefits of the God company? And what would our job description look like? And you might be asking at this point, why are you saying this to me? I'm not a missionary. The early apostles were missionaries. Well, Jesus said, if you have been baptized and repented of your sins, then you are a disciple of Christ. Therefore, you have the job. You have been hired by the God company. So Jesus chose 12 disciples to preach, teach, and heal. What were the characteristics of these early apostles? Well, first of all, they were all called by Jesus, and they accepted the call. They were baptized and they repented of their sins. And they even told him they were willing to leave their homes, their familiar environments, with just the shirts on their back and travel anywhere in the world that he sent them to preach, teach, and to heal. But their dispositions, their characteristics, varied greatly. There were four fishermen, two hot-tempered apostles, one tax collector who worked for the Romans, and one political zealot. But they all had characteristics that Jesus was looking for in terms of they were people's people who could go out and meet the different people in the communities that they were going out to reach. Um, they were compassionate and not condemning. They were good communicators. And you would have thought maybe they would have a lot of education in the, the early scriptures 
but instead they were really common people that didn't have a lot of education other than what Jesus gave them. And the Lord of the harvest sent them out to find and empower new disciples to go out into the world. So, so far we're okay with this job description and you are now a member of the God Company. So as Jesus is sending them out, he gives a few final words to them because they are totally overwhelmed with the job that they have to do. He says, as you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. And then he goes on to say, if they're not interested in what you have to say, just shake the dust off your feet and go on to the next house. The vicar of St. Martin's in the field in London uh, suggests that he's not really saying just for, uh, forego these people, shake the dust off your feet, but he's saying shaking the dust off your feet is really a way of praying to God that I've done the best I can and now it's up to you to finish converting these people or making them into your own disciples. And missionaries of today are not just people that go out into the world. They are also people who preach to you here in your own church, who lead Bible studies, who do children's Sunday school. And unfortunately, rather than meeting even anger or um, dismissing you, they're very kind of indifferent, saying, uh, well, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, and I know that if I've been baptized and accepted Jesus, that I'm assured of eternal salvation. So I don't know why you keep talking to me about these things. I've already understood. Well, Jesus has um, a lot more to say about this, so let's listen to some more of his words and see if we can't understand a little more of our job description. What are the benefits of the job company? Well, first of all, there's this wonderful book, the Bible, that covers every contingency. There are sermons every week that go through some part of the Bible and over a three-year period cover every critical part of the Bible. There are Bible studies, prayer groups. You even have a direct line to God at any time. And he gives you a spiritual gift, at least one, for you to use for your work for him. So I'd say it's probably time to leave the church and go off into our community. So the apostles now are in the field. And again, as I said, they are totally overwhelmed by the complexity and the need that they're being asked to address. And those of us that are also in the world today have that same feeling. And I liked a story by Lauren Isley called The Star Thrower because it really puts the scope of the work into perspective. There once was a young girl who was frantically throwing starfish after starfish after starfish into the ocean. And there was an onlooker who was very perplexed and finally said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm throwing the starfish back into the water before they dry out and die. And the onlooker looked at the beach and said, but there are thousands of starfish. You're not going to make even a dent in that. And she said, well, the starfish that I do throw back in the water, to them, it makes all the difference. To them, it makes all the difference. I was a missionary in Africa for two years, and I had a similar feeling when I was there. So many of the babies died so many of the mothers died during childbirth. And it was so frustrating because there was a hospital right there with a pediatrician, doctors and nurses, but they never brought the babies to us until it was too late. And it was most likely because um, they waited too long and then the babies died. And then it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we bring the baby to the hospital, it will die. So the sister asked me to help write a, a grant for a mobile unit to go out into the villages. She said, we must reach the people where they are, and hopefully we'll be able to slowly bring them back into the hospital. And so we had a, a van, we had audiovisual materials that were run by a generator, and we went out into the villages and weighed and gave immunizations to the babies. The nurses taught the mothers how to 
what kind of nutritional food they should be feeding the babies. And if the baby was sick, then we brought the baby and the mom back to the hospital. And slowly, they started to come to the hospital on their own. So Jesus broke down this daunting work even more, and he said, this is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone. The smallest act of giving or receiving is important. And he also wanted them to be hospitable, to accept hospitality and to give hospitality. Henry Newen defined hospitality as the creation of free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. And I experienced this again when I was a missionary. I felt I was a really awful missionary. First of all, I didn't speak the language. Second of all, I couldn't possibly proselytize to anybody. But I found, as I looked back over the year, that I did do some good things, and, but they were very small and simple things. And an example um, of this might be when uh, we were invited to a village um, by a chief who had received some dental work for dinner. And we found um, my husband and I and our houseman in this mud hut with a little table and three chairs eating the whole entire protein source for the village for the week, which consisted of a couple of chickens boiled with their heads and innards all accompanying together. And the fun part of that for me was then I had to invite them back to our house for dinner and wondering what I should serve an African village was told that a roasted goat would be the perfect thing. And so that's what we had, hospitality given and taken, eating together, a very simple act. Another time, the dental technician who worked for my husband had just gotten married. He had built himself a large mud hut and he was very excited about it. He wanted us to come out, it was quite a distance, and spend the night and we said sure. And he went and found a bed for us because he heard Azungus like beds and he never, he didn't use a bed. So I don't know how he got this bed into this hut, but, and there was no roof on the hut yet. So we spent the night under the starlights um, on this comfortable bed, hoping that the lions would stay away, which they did. And finally, I think the most important thing I did was when I'd had my second child, my son, um, I had noticed that a lot of the moms were bottle feeding their babies because that's what the European women were doing and the Indian women were doing and they wanted to be modern. But they had no way of um, sterilizing this and a lot of the babies were getting sick. So I decided that you know I would intentionally nurse my baby wherever I went. And it was not always a comfortable situation. I, I would find myself in a hut with children and adults staring in the windows, you know, sitting on the floor looking up in just awed amazement. But in the end, it made a big difference in our community. So again, it's just intentionally doing those simple everyday things that we do and uh, doing it in a way that shows Christ's love. And the early um, disciples, that's what they did. They listened. They gave a kind word, a prayer, a kind act. They accepted with generosity, and they gave with generosity. In other words, they found Christ in everyone. Christ in the stranger, in the enemy. Christ in the friend, the spouse, the sibling. Christ in the political person who makes our blood boil, who feels differently than us. For if we see Christ in all of these people, then just perhaps, they will see Christ in us. So our church today is very much like the hospital in Malawi. We have a wonderful, beautiful church. We have great people and we have educated people, but very few people come. They, they just are not understanding why they need to come. And so it's important for us who are now working in the God company as a disciple to reach out to these people. And how are we to do that, you might ask. 
And I suggest that we start by reconnecting with our spiritual gifts. And a spiritual gift is something that you do, that you really enjoy doing, that brings you joy. And uh, do it intentionally. So it could be anything from calling on the telephone, visiting people, working in the thrift store, any simple thing that you do, but you do it with intention of saying, I represent God and God loves you. So that when you see the grocery clerk, you say, God bless you, thank you for doing your work. Or when you visit a shut-in, I'll pray for you. What can I bring you next time? So our church space is doing a lot of good programs and we are very generous with using our programs for our community. But we also need to look as a group to think about what can we do um, as a church to bring people in. And we need to look and see what are the needs in our community. One need I can see is that there are a lot of elderly people living on their own um, who are very lonely and often don't get a warm meal at the end of the day. So perhaps we could have a few days a week where they could come in and have some socialization and a, and a hot dinner at five o'clock or we could ask some of the children whose parents work and don't have after school care to come in, do their homework and have a warm meal and actually get to interact with some of the older people. There's many, many ideas, but this is a time for us to think about it. We have probably a, a good year to start thinking about how are we gonna use these wonderful upgraded things we have now in our church. So go forth intentionally and use your spiritual gifts and enjoy what's been given to you. I'd like to close by telling you a parable about the potato, egg, and coffee beans. There once was a young teenager girl who came to her father and said, oh father, my life is just miserable. I don't, I don't have the things I want. Uh, my friends aren't always nice to me. I am just having a terrible, terrible week. And he listened to her, and he was a chef. And he said, come with me, dear daughter. And he brought her into the kitchen, and he put on three pots of boiling water. And into one pot, he put potatoes. And into another, he put an egg. And into a third, he put coffee beans. And he let them boil for 30 minutes. And then he took them off the heat, and he took the potatoes out and put them on a plate, the egg, and the beans, uh, the beans he left in the water, and poured them into a cup. And he said to his daughter, who had been complaining this whole time, daughter, what do you see? And she rolled her eyes and said, well, I see a potato, I see an egg, and I see coffee beans. He said, well, let's touch them. Remember that potato went in hard and unrelenting? How does it feel now? And the potato was soft and mushy. He said, that's what that potato, what happened to that potato when it dealt <clears throat> with adversity. It went in hard and unrelenting and came out soft and mushy. And how about the egg? Well, the egg is hard boiled now, she said. That's right. It was very fragile. It had a fragile shell and was runny, but now it's hard. And how about the coffee beans? Well, she took a sip of the fragrant aroma and she said, oh, this is just so comforting. I, I love this cup of coffee. And he said, well, the cup of coffee, the beans, transformed the water. They didn't just adapt to it. They transformed the water into something that was very, um, smelled very warm and nurturing and welcoming. So think, dear daughter, how you want to address adversity when it comes your way. Uh, and I ask each of you also, as we're getting older, we're facing more and more adversity. And I hope that we will face it in the way that the little coffee bean does when faced with that boiling water, that we will be able to provide a warm, welcoming cup of coffee to all those who we meet and all those who invite us to, into their lives also. Amen.
the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. O Lord who provides, ignite the hearts and souls of the leaders of this country, this community, and this world with extra grace and strength of character to act upon your will and wisdom for all your pre people. We pray especially for our president and our elected representatives, both state and local, all government advisors. May they make wise and thoughtful choices, and we pray for our U.S. service people. O oh Lord, who re provides, restore hope and health to those who struggle with continuing illness, isolation, or homelessness, and stamina for all who give support. We now join our hearts together to pray for those in need, Carolyn and Elwyn Barnes, Chris Bean, Barbara Baker, Jenny Wennerstrom, Skip Brunetto, Allison and Janie Coley, Dottie Cotter, Susie DeWitt, Sarah DeWitt, Dale Gorman, Earl and Sarah Johnson, and the families of those recently departed, especially Stu and Kathy Parsons. O oh Lord who provides, to your everlasting arms we lift up all who have exchanged this earthly life to flourish in the peace of eternity with you. We pray especially for Connie Soper, Millie Perry, Jim Scarls, Deanie Caldwell, Isabel Cunningham, and all those who we hold dear in our hearts. O oh Lord, we who provides, we pause in this moment to offer our heartfelt thanksgivings, intercessions, petitions, and memorials. We thank you for keeping so many of our members healthy during this crisis. Keep our neighbors safe as well as those who continue to shelter in our church. We celebrate with you the anniversary of our pastor Tim and his wife Rhea. O Lord who provides, fortify and sustain those chosen to help us navigate the time and tides of this human experience. Impart refreshment in spiritual wisdom to preach your word. Encourage your understanding and connect us to you in everyday living. We pray especially for our Bishop Suda Devadar and District Superintendent Reverend Andrew Foster II, our national and local church, and especially for our Pastor Tim and the Born and Katamit uh, United Methodist councils and leaders. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are open with us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We ask all who are able to contribute to keep the ministries of God's church continuing. We pray for the time when we can meet again together in person and we request all who are able to mail their pledges and offerings to the church that we each attend. Let us give with joy.
And now our prayer of dedication, which we can all read together in unison. Gracious God, your hospitality has surrounded us and welcomed us, even when we only grudgingly extended hospitality to sisters and brothers who are also your children. May we grow each day in our willingness to be welcoming disciples, not just to those who look like us, talk like us, or think like us. May our offering this morning be received not just in gratitude for your hospitality, but as our way to extend comfort and welcome to those for whom your love is a mystery. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. And now we go forth singing, and with prayer and singing. Uh, the hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See. May the Lord bless you and keep you in his loving arms. Go in peace to serve the Lord in all ways and in all places. Let us now go forth singing, God be with you till we meet again. <laughs> 